Hello and welcome to Film 253, Narrative in Digital Age. This is going to be the introductory lecture for the first unit of the course. From the birth of a cinema, film theorists and film historians um, were interested to define the medium of specificity, how it's different than other narrative art forms, such as literature or theater focusing on things that were um, strictly cinematic, the visual elements, that it doesn't have sound or dialogues in the beginning, so it's different than other forms of narrative arts with verbal compositions, for example, the idea of editing, and getting too close to the subject, close-ups, uh, expressive performances. However, it's undeniable that cinema borrows certain narrative techniques from other narrative art forms. Still, there are certain things that are unique to, to cinematic techniques. Knowing that, for example, in movies, the camera is the primary narrator. We're going to discuss mostly fictional uh, elements of uh, narrative or narration in fictional films today. But before that, uh, you should know that uh, cinema is always a narrative medium. And it's just because of the fact that it's it's a temporal medium, it always employs narrative techniques and, and certain elements of narration. Uh, so documentary films are scripted. They, um, without any elements of narration, documentary films would be as dull as those images uh, captured by the security cameras in the grocery stores. So knowing that experimental films, art films, and documentary films, they all employ um, elements of narrative techniques. So what is a narration? So narration is the act of telling the stories, and the narrator is who or what tells the story. So in cinema, we, we can use a number of things, number of perspectives, flashbacks that explain the character's past, voiceover. So there are all different approaches to story. And or one thing that makes cinema unique is the multiplicity of perspectives. Not that in literature or novels, we don't have a, a, some sort of a polyphonic uh, way of storytelling, but usually that is done in a very complicated ways by writers such as Nabokov or uh, James Joyce. This can be achieved in a very digestible way in cinema. The voiceover can say something and the camera is telling us something else. And so let's talk about one fact. We have voiceovers, we have characters telling the stories in the movies, and usually they borrow those techniques from literature. But once again, uh, in every movie, the camera is the primarily narrator. So its narration consists of many visual elements it captures and arranges in every composition, in every shot. So the camera is uh, helping uh, the audience to, to create the, the story. However, camera is not always a movie's only narrator. Editing, for example, is an important element of storytelling, how we put the images together. So in literature, traditionally, we have three modes of narrative, first person narrator, third person narrator, and omniscient a narrator. Uh, so the first person is, uh, we, we kind of read everything, all uh, the, the mental impulses of the, uh, the first person, or just how he uh, describes his own story. The third person is when a character, not the central character, a secondary character, who is not actually important in the story is telling uh, the story of usually the, 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 the central character. An example of that is the great Gatsby. So Nick is, is the storyteller, but it's not his story. It's actually the story of Gatsby. So, and Omniscient is someone who is not part of the, the story, but knows everything about it. it it's like some sort of God's um, a point of view uh, narration. So to, an example of uh, Omniscient can be seen in the, the movie Royal Tenenbaum by Wes Anderson, um, showing the, uh, the opening scene. The summer house on Eagles Island. Hold it, Chazzy. Hold it right there. What are you doing? You're on my team. <laughs> there are no teams. Ah! 
The BB was still lodged between two knuckles in Chas's left hand. Margot Tenenbaum was adopted at age two. Her father had always noted this when introducing her. This is my adopted daughter, Margot Tenenbaum. She was a playwright and won a Braverman grant of $50,000 in the ninth grade. So what you see that the narrator is not part of the film, is not in the film, has no interest. Uh, like he just, he knows. Uh, that, that voiceover knows everything about every character, more than even the, the characters in the film. Hi, Eli. You said I could run away too. No, I didn't. And don't tell anyone you saw us. They shared a sleeping bag and survived on crackers and root beer. Four years later, Margot disappeared alone for two weeks and came back with half a finger missing. Richie Tenenbaum had been a champion tennis player since the third grade. He turned pro at 17 and won the U.S. Nationals three years in a row. He kept the studio in the corner of the ballroom, but had failed to develop as a painter. Up. Up. Right. On weekends, Royal took him on outings around the city. These invitations were never extended to anyone else. So, uh, back to our, uh, my first point about multiplicity of perspectives in cinema. And uh, so, even when we have a first person narrator, actually, usually we don't employ that voiceover in, through the entire uh, story. And I said that usually we have a number of devices in cinema that they also tell us stories. So I'm going to show um, uh, a scene from American Psycho. So it's a uh, first person narrative is actually uh, kind of adapted from a novel. Uh, employees a first person narrative. But the scene that you're going to watch, you would see the difference between the camera narrator and a first person uh, narrator. You hear the voiceover of Bateman's first-person narrators, uh, Bateman's character in this scene, and how he's very much uh, concerned and obsessed about business card. But what the camera reveals to us uh, is that all these um, cards are very similar. It seems that just the names are different, even the phone numbers, so they're exact same cards. So these confused people, and they also misrecognize each other, uh, so the, the use of voiceover narration, first person uh, voiceover narration is very ironic in that scene because it's not necessarily the sentiment uh, that the film is trying to, to pass on. So you see the, a, a clear uh, difference between a first person narrator and how the camera narrates the scene. Thanks for looking after Courtney. Dorcia. How impressive. How on earth did you get a reservation there? Lucky, I guess. That's a wonderful suit. Don't tell me, don't tell me, let me guess. Mm, Valentino Couture. Uh -huh. hmm. You look so soft. Your compliment was sufficient, Louis. Hello, Halber Stram. Nice tie. How the hell are you? Alan has mistaken me for this dickhead, Marcus Halberstram. It seems logical because Marcus also works at PNP and in fact does the same exact thing I do. He also has a pension for Valentino's suits and Oliver Peoples' glasses. Marcus and I even go to the same barber, although I have a slightly better haircut. So how's the ransom account going, Marcus? It's, uh, it's all right. Really? That's interesting. It's not, uh, it's not great. Oh, well, you know. So how's Cecilia? She's a great girl. Oh, yeah. I'm very lucky. Mm-hmm. Hey, Alan. Congratulations on the Fisher account. Thank you, Baxter. Listen, Paul, squash. Call me. What, Friday? No can do. I got an 8.30 res at Dorcia. Great. Sea urchin ceviche. Dorcia on Friday night, how'd he swing that? I think he's lying. 
We can also think of the interesting use of sound effect when they take cards out of the cases. It sounds like the Japanese swords uh, as part of this sort of um, male rivalry between them. It's just like they are preparing uh, the fight. No can do. I got an 830 res at Dorsia. Great. Sea urchin ceviche. Dorsia on Friday night. How do you swing that? I think he's lying. Is that a gram? New card. What do you think? Woohoo! Very nice. Look at that. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. Good coloring. That's bone. And the lettering is something called Cillian Braille. It's very cool, Bateman, but that's nothing. Look at this. That is really nice. Eggshell with Romalian type. What do you think? Nice. Jesus. That is really super. How to nitwit like you get so tasteful? I can't believe that Bryce prefers Van Patten's card to mine. But wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. Raised lettering. Pale Nimbus. White. Impressive. Very nice. Mm. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Love white coloring. A tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. Something wrong? Patrick? You're sweating. So uh, the first um, three modes were uh, employed um, by literature and something that cinema borrowed from literature. Um, and but what you saw that in that clip in American Psycho that it could be very different just to use a first person narrator in cinema and literature. The the next one, direct address, is something that is used in theater uh, first, uh, and uh, you can trace it back to ancient Greek and then uh, Shakespeare. Uh, but it has been theorized by a German playwright, Bertolt Brecht. So, uh, in, uh, in the plays of Brecht, uh, characters were showing some sort of an awareness of the, uh, the story uh, and, and the work that they were in. Um, so, like breaking the fourth wall, they were addressing the audiences directly, so they were not accepting that there is a wall, there is a barrier between uh, the actors in theater and um, the uh, the audience in the theater, so they were ad 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 um, directly addressing the audiences. Um, in cinema, actually, this, these effects can be approached in different ways. It's, it's not just the actors directly speaking to cameras. So there are all uh, sort of devices from the editing and cinematography that in, in cinema they can use to, to break the fourth wall. So an example of that usually uh, used in comedy is by Woody Allen. Uh, it's something that classical Hollywood movies didn't permit uh, the performers to do. Uh, so it was like in the 60s and 70s with directors, new directors in Hollywood like Woody Allen, they started to, to use these uh, Brechtian techniques. Henrietta Farrell, just Miss Perfect all the time. And, and Ivan Ackerman, always the wrong answer. Always. Seven three is nine. Even then I knew they were just jerks. In 1942, I had already discovered women. Ah, he kissed me! He kissed me! Ah. That's the second time this month. Step up here. What did I do? Step up here. What did I do? You should be ashamed of yourself. Why? I was just expressing a healthy sexual curiosity. Six-year-old boys don't have girls on their minds. I did. For God's sake, Shabby, Edward Floyd speaks of a latency period. Well, I never had a latency period. I can't help it. Why couldn't you have been more like Donald? Now there was a model boy. Tell the folks where you are today, Donald. I'm on a profitable dress company. Boy, sometimes I wonder where my classmates are today. I'm president of the pinkest plumbing company. I sell taluses. I used to be a heroin addict. Now I'm a methadone addict. 
I'm into leather. Perspired and everything. Well, didn't you take a, a shower at the club? So this is another scene in the hall. So I just say it's not always just that they, they uh, like in cinema, it's not just uh, the actors addressing the cameras, looking at the camera. There are other things that uh, a, a filmmakers uh, can employ to create some sort of awareness of uh, the, um, uh, the the fact that we're watching a movie and just break the, the, the so-called fourth wall. You know what Grammy Hall would call a real Jew? Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, she hates Jews. She thinks they just make money. But let me tell you, I mean, she's the one. And is she ever, I'm telling you. So did you do those photographs in there or what? Yeah, yeah, I sort of dabble around, you know. They're, they're, they're wonderful, you know, they have a... They have a quality. Well, I, I, I would like to take a serious photography course. Photography is interesting because, you know, it's a, it's a new art form and a, a set of aesthetic criteria have not emerged yet. Aesthetic criteria? You mean whether it's a good photo or not? The, the medium enters in as a condition of the art form itself. Well, well to me, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's all instinctive, you know? I mean, I just try to uh, feel it, you know? I try to get a sense of it and not think about it so much. It's still, still, you need a set of aesthetic guidelines to put it in social perspective, I think. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess you must be sort of late, huh? You know what? got to get there and begin whining soon. <laughs> Um, so the last thing is restricted narration. Uh, so uh, this is something actually we can uh, talk a little more uh, when we discuss the story and plot. Restricted narration is and then the narrator is uh, like the, the, the movie is showing just limited uh, aspects of the scene. So like uh, a, a typical uh, moment is that when the character is opens the door, we see uh, the reaction shot, shot uh, um, like he or she is shocked, for example, but by, by what they see. So we see that close up, we see the reaction shot, we know something strange or bad or shocking is inside that room that they open, but it's never shown to us. That's restricting our access to, to, uh, to certain uh, spaces or moments to, to create uh, and complete this story. There are also uh, the, the issue of character uh, identifications or character engagement. We sympathize or empathize with the characters, uh, uh, usually the main ones in the movies. Uh, David Bordwell believes that uh, we need a more scientific terms rather than empathy or sympathy because we don't exactly empathize or identify with characters uh, in this queen. Um, he used these two terms, alignment and allegiance. So one is the objective perspective presented to the spectator by the camera. So if you have a central character, but certain times, certain uh, moments in a movie, uh, uh, we hear dialogues or we are present somewhere that, that the character is not there uh, without the presence of the central character. So not, not all the information uh, to build uh, and, and complete the storylines were presented by the, the point of view or perspectives of the central character. Uh, allegiance, however, when uh, the, the positions of the spectators is very subjective. When we have the characters all the time uh, in uh, the situation, usually in detective films, everything is revealed to us when it's revealed uh, by, by the clues that uh, uh, the detective uh, gains. And contemporary films, we have even this uh, feeling of allegiance goes to the degree that we have this eye camera things, usually in horror movies, uh, contemporary horror movies like Diary of the Bear, the Blair Witch, Pro uh, Blair Witch Project, and, uh, and popular movies like that, The Wreck. So everything uh, is presented to us by exact view uh, of uh, the, the, the character. Uh, so you don't see anyone else's perspective uh, and you don't even see the, the character's face, you just, you're in the, his uh, viewpoint. So I want to show two clips from Chinatown to, to show, um, kind of, or elaborate on the differences between uh, alignment and allegiance. Is the film that we totally learn everything in this film through, or, or the, 
the eyes of the detective, hard-boiled detective, the, the Jack Nicholson character. And except one or two scenes that actually uh, something is shown to us quickly and well, the, the camera uh, uh, stays with another character, not the main character. Usually we see everything when it's been uh, presented to uh, the central character, the Jack Nicholson character. Better come with me. But why? There's nothing more to say. Will you get my car, please? Okay, go home. But in case you're interested, your husband was murdered. Somebody has been dumping thousands of tons of water from the city's reservoirs, and we're supposed to be in the middle of a drought. He found out about it, and he was killed. There's a waterlogged drunk in the morgue, involuntary manslaughter if anybody wants to take the trouble, which they don't. It seems like half the city is trying to cover it all up, which is fine by me. But Mrs. Mulray, I goddamn near lost my nose, and I like it. I like breathing through it. And I still think that you're hiding something. So you hear real instances uh, in this movie that um, the, the character leaves, the Jack Nicholson character leaves, and the camera stays with another character. Because usually we are confused um, uh, as uh, he is confused, and um, just we don't get information from other characters. So it's the first time you see uh, her facial expressions is just revealed to the audience, not to the, uh, the, the characters we are aligned with. Uh, the opposite of this scene uh, uh, happens uh, in the last scene. She's mine, too. She's never going to know that. Evelyn, you're a disturbed woman. You cannot hope to provide. Evelyn, put that gun away. Let the police handle this. He owns the police. Get away from her. You'll have to kill me first. Get away. Get away. Captain, close the door. So at, at this point we hear the blowing of the horn, we know something happens but the camera doesn't get there. Up to the point that the characters that we are aligned with is getting there. So we, nothing is revealed to us before the characters that uh, we are in allegiance. So with uh, breaking the fourth wall and contemporary Hollywood films, because it was something that was supposed to be very didactic. Um, uh, so in classical Hollywood cinema, it was not really permitted. The uh, classical Hollywood cinema, the mainstream Hollywood, uh, uh, they wanted the audience to forget that uh, they were watching the movie, to, to be kind of, um, uh, uh, in a way, uh, immersed in, in the world of the film and never really see uh, any um, uh, sort of uh, uh, any awareness uh, 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 about uh, the fact that they are watching the movie. So direct address is doing the opposite. And uh, so with that direct address characters display the awareness about the cinematic modes of production that they are in. So at the first, uh, it was considered as something um, uh, in um, European art film, this sort of breaking techniques in the films of Jean-Luc Godard so there's not really a mainstream films. And then we have uh, new American cinema directors like Woody Allen, for, uh, for, for instance, started to use that in American cinema. Uh, but contemporary Hollywood films actually uh, use that to increase the pleasure, something that was in Jean-Luc Godard films, uh, was employed uh, to uh, take away, uh, to kind of work against the, the Hollywood um, idea of increasing the the, the uh, 
visual pleasure, the pleasures uh, for the, the audience to follow the story, usually ending, happy ending, is to um, kind of deny that from the audience. Contemporary, uh, actually, Hollywood films and uh, actually television series, they started to use those techniques in order to increase the pleasure. So nowadays, that technique uh, of uh, the uh, breaking the fourth wall or direct address is not as didactic as it used to be in European art films. It's actually a very common technique in main mainstream films. So look at the, the next two clips. Incredible. One of the worst performances of my career, and they never doubted it for a second. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? This is my ninth sick day this semester. It's getting pretty tough coming up with new illnesses. If I go for 10, I'm probably going to have to barf up a lung. So I better make this one count. The key to faking out the parents is the clammy hands. It's a good non-specific symptom. I'm a big believer in it. A lot of people will tell you that a good phony fever is a deadlock, but uh, you get a nervous mother, you could wind up in a doctor's office. That's worse than school. You fake a stomach cramp, and when you're bent over, moaning and wailing, you lick your palms. It's a little childish and stupid, but then so is high school. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. I do have a test today. That wasn't bullshit. It's on European socialism. I mean, really, what's the point? I'm not European. I don't plan on being European. So who gives a crap if they're socialists? They can be fascist anarchists. It still wouldn't change the fact that I don't own a car. I recall Central Park in fall. How you toy a dress. What a mess. I confess. So you saw that by blocking uh, with his hand the camera, it, it knows the existence of the camera inside the shower room. So we are not, we, we know that sort of awareness of the, the uh, position of the camera and the characters is aware of the fact. So it's not just the story word that they are in. Uh, so the, usually with the voiceover, it's uh, creating some sort of ironical things. If you've seen, for instance, American Beauty. Um, remember, in the, at some point in the movie, it says that uh, this is the day, um, uh, this is the last day of the rest of my life, so I will be dead uh, tonight. So it's just, how can you be dead and at the same time um, narrate this story, for example? So this is contemporary Hollywood mainstream film stars to, started to employ um, uh, the um, direct address mode into popular entertainment, something that we uh, never had in uh, classical Hollywood cinema. Um, the, the most important concepts that we should learn and for the screening quiz today is uh, the story versus plot. Story is the chronological sequence of events and plot is the uh, causal and logical structure which connects the events. Plot consists of specific action and events that the filmmaker selects and the order in which they arrange those events to effectively convey the narrative to the viewer. So there are a number of ways that the, the plot approaches the story. Usually we have three uh, kind of um, three acts of structure, linear narrative in mainstream Hollywood films that we usually follow the story and the plot is helping us to build the story. They, they correspond to each other pretty well. But contemporary films, films like Memento, if you've seen, uh, uh, Inception maybe, even like Mother. Uh, Mother is a little different. It's just something that you always, uh, the plot is a little restricted narration because the plot is always, you realize that there is something else. But films like Memento, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan's films, Irreversible, um, uh, all these films are trying to, to create some sort of tricks so the plot tricks us in a kind of in the way we construct this story so it always plays with the way we usually assume um, 
what the story is. So the, the way the plot is uh, organized uh, is like a puzzle, uh, so uh, it's not, first of all, as easy to create that as stories, or films like uh, Pulp Fiction, they're, ju they're just messing up. So there is a linear uh, narrative, but they're just sort of, uh, it it's been kind of um, destroyed. Uh, so there are also fork narratives, right? La run, Lotta Run, we see possibilities. So there are possible different narratives, uh, different stories. Uh, but if you've seen the films like Memento, uh, it's all about sort of how the viewers are always um, kind of misinformed by the plot, maybe, to create the story. And, and it's just about um, kind of uh, this puzzle. So you usually need to see these movies more than once, films like Memento or uh, Irreversible. Um, and uh, kind of a number of actually contemporary films are playing with that sort of um, they're trick films. Um, uh, there are films of like uh, an Iranian filmmaker, Asghar Farhadi, uh, if you've seen Separation or Passe or um, uh, uh, film The Salesman. Uh, what the plot is trying to do, you create the story, but you always realize that there is something more. So there are narrative twists that you realize the way you were building the story was not enough. Uh, there are secondary characters uh, and some. Uh, certain events that you think they were unimportant that uh, they started to serve purpose later kind of it's revealed to us that they actually are very significant so their story is always becoming bigger and bigger uh, unlike what we expect um, so uh, there are story duration plot duration and screen duration so screen duration is obviously movies and running time plot duration uh, the the, the uh, lapse time of uh, those events within the story that the film explicitly presents, and the story duration, the amount of time that the uh, imply the story takes to occur. In Twelve Angry Men, uh, so Casablanca, the plot duration is probably is taking place in a couple of weeks when the um, um, Ingrid Bergman came to Casablanca and the, the events and then the uh, the, the escape. Um, so it's it just possibly one or two weeks, uh, um, or maybe a little more. That's the uh, plot duration. But the story duration is a little bit more, a little bit more, probably years, because with the flashback that is inserted, we know some background about what happened. Uh, uh, so we know for the story from the time that Burgers and Bergman were in love in Paris. We don't know anything from uh, about uh, prior events. Uh, so the story from, is, starts from there uh, to the end of the film. So it's more than um, probably, maybe in a couple of years. So in this scene in uh, uh, Citizen King, the breakfast scene, try to identify the story duration, plot duration, and the screen duration. I was very graceful. Uh, uh, we were talking about the first Mrs. Kane. And what was she like? She was like all the girls I knew in dancing school. A very nice girl, very nice. Emily was a little nicer. <clears throat> well, after the first couple of months, she and Charlie didn't see much of each other except at breakfast. It was a marriage just like any other marriage. You're very, very beautiful. I've never been to six parties in my Extremely life. Extremely beautiful. Life. I'm living beneath this place. It's a matter of habit. I wonder what the servants will think. They'll think we enjoyed ourselves. Yes. Didn't we? I don't see why you have to go straight after the newspaper. You never should have married a newspaper man. They're worse than sailors. I absolutely adore you. Oh, Charles, even newspaper men have to sleep. I'll call Mr. Bernstein, have him put off my appointments until noon. What time is it? I don't know, it's late. It's early. Charles, do you know how long you kept me waiting last night while you went to the newspaper for ten minutes? What do you do in a newspaper in the middle of the night? Emily, my dear, your only correspondent is the Inquirer. 
Sometimes I think I'd prefer a rival of flesh and blood. Oh, Emily, I don't spend that much time on the newspaper. It isn't just the time. It's what you print, attacking the president. You mean Uncle John? I mean the president of the United States. He's still Uncle John. He's still a well-meaning fathead who's running a pack of high-pressure crooks around his administration. This whole oil scandal... He happens to be the president, Charles, not you. That's a mistake that will be corrected one of these days. Your Mr. Bernstein sent Junior the most incredible atrocity yesterday, Charles. I simply can't have it in the nursery. Mr. Bernstein is apt to pay a visit to the nursery now and then. Does he have to? Yes. Really, Charles? People will think... What I tell them to think. So the uh, the film time or duration time is uh, two minutes and thirty eight seconds. Uh, probably uh, the plot time is just the interview started, and it just takes for the interviewer to describe the whole scene. It's just probably we assume that it takes like maybe a couple of hours or something. Uh, but the story time years uh, distance is growing between husband and wife. First they are more intimate, and then uh, so over the years. Uh, that we can see the growing distance. <laughs> 